went from the judges and the prophets uh, to being ruled by a king. And remember, the desire of God for the nation of Israel was that they would be a theocracy. Um, you know, a, a nation that was being ruled by God um, religiously, obviously, but also remember the law. When the law is broken down, there's ceremonial law, there's social law, there's moral law, and uh, all of those uh, laws were instituted by God to govern the country. You know, the Israelites, they wanted to be like the nations around them. You know, they wanted a king. And, you know, there have been some who have said that this was one of the saddest points of time in uh, Jewish history because they ended up getting what they wanted, and I don't think uh, that it was everything that they thought it was going to be. But really, the motivation, the desire of the people to be like the nations around them, I think that's something that's good for us to really think through and consider, even for ourselves, right? We're supposed to be governed by God, and we're not supposed to <laughs> desire to be like necessarily people around us. We want to have a unique life, sanctified. The word sanctified means set apart. And, you know, that's certainly, you know, I think what the desire of God is for you and for me. Sometimes there's worldliness that begins to creep into our life. And we begin to look at the world around us. And we begin to desire the things of the world. Sometimes that even becomes part of our prayer life. And God says to us, you know, I don't want you to be like the world. We're supposed to be in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. Of course, you remember the first king of Israel was? King Saul. Saul. King Saul. And then uh, that didn't go all that well, did it? Saul had good beginnings when he was small in his own eyes, right? I mean, he began humbly. He wasn't really even desiring to be the king. Uh, remember when he was being anointed by Samuel the prophet? Uh, he was hiding among the, you know, equipment. And then something happened in Saul's life. You know, there was a huge transition. There was a change. He really began to uh, depart from God. Uh, he was concerned more about himself and his legacy. God said through Samuel the prophet to Saul, go and wipe them out. You know, I want you to wipe the Amalekites out completely. I don't want you to leave anything left. Not adult, not child, no animals, nothing. Samuel said, did you do everything that God told you to do? He said, yeah. And he said, well, what's that I hear in the background, the bleeding of sheep? And then he had this justification for why he was disobedient. By the way, there's no legitimate justification for being disobedient to God. But remember, Samuel said to Saul, he said, um, he said that disobedience, rebellion is like witchcraft. Yes. And that God desires obedience even over sacrifice. And so remember, Saul was upset. He stretched his hand out to Samuel, tore the hem of Samuel's garment. And, and Samuel, or Samuel said to him, he said, listen, this is what's just happened to you. The kingdom has been torn from your hands. God has selected somebody else. <clears throat> and you guys remember the story of how God selected David. David had some pretty rugged experiences, didn't he? You know, I, I, I love the scriptures and how they don't hide the reality of people's lives. But David had his struggles. Remember David, instead of going out with the kings, as was the custom, when it was a time of war, he stayed back. He was on the roof of his house. He looked. He saw a woman bathing. Her name was Bathsheba. Um, he obviously was interested in her. He had a sexual relationship with her. She got pregnant. A little bit of a problem because Uriah the Hittite, her husband, was off at war where David should have been. And so David works this whole thing out. He's trying to cover up his sin, right? You cannot cover, I cannot cover up sin. It, it always gets shouted from the rooftops. And so ultimately he has Uriah the Hittite murdered. And, you know, David's got multiple wives. He has multiple sons. Uh, God had selected Solomon to take the kingdom from David when Solomon was 12 years old. There was some conflict on how this worked out. Ultimately, Solomon was uh, anointed as the king. And uh, Solomon had a pretty rugged history as well. 700 wives, 300 concubines. I mean, you know, that's colorful, to say the least. He had a colorful life. Um, but then when Solomon died, there was a battle over, again, over who was going to take the throne. And Rehoboam was his son. Uh, Rehoboam took the throne. At that point, it was still a united kingdom. But Rehoboam, when he took over, 
the older advisors came to him and said, listen, this is how you need to rule. You need to rule as a servant. You need to be gentle. You need to speak wisely and kindly to your people. You know, don't put a yoke of bondage around them. And Rehoboam said, I have... I don't even want to hear your advice. He said, what I'm going to do, as the younger guys came to him and gave him advice, he said, I'm going to make the most difficult burden that my dad put on them seem like nothing at all. I'm going to drive these people. Listen, he ended up driving the people, and they rebelled against him, and the kingdom ultimately split. There was a rebellion. The northern kingdom split away from the southern kingdom. Remember the two tribes in the southern kingdom were who? Judah and, Judah and Benjamin. All the rest said, man, we want absolutely nothing to do with you. Jeroboam had been exiled by Solomon earlier because he was a threat to the kingdom. He'd gone to Egypt. And then when there was division uh, in the empire, when there was an opportunity for him, he came back. And Jeroboam ultimately was selected by the people of the ten northern tribes to be their king.